where I need it. Whatever uh, we are doing, I think most of the things we have learned from Sar only about peripheral intervention. Uh, it will be a great opportunity to learn from Sir also and great Sir's job. comments great on job. these cases. So today my topic is below the knee intervention and uh, as uh, interventional cardiology is expanding more and more so we have, we are becoming uh, we are trying to do more peripheral interventions also some problem okay okay so uh, uh, i i hear my own voice actually that so, people uh, can mute uh, their side so there will not be any echo so uh, please, please continue. It was uh, from Dr. Smith. Now he is disconnected from one device. So okay. it is, you can continue. Yeah, so a quick revision of this. I, everybody, all of us are well aware, but a quick revision. So clinical spectrum of presentation for PAD can be asymptomatic. Majority of the patients are actually asymptomatic till they go into a certain level of stenosis and disease. Then they can develop atypical symptoms. Intermittent claudication is the classic symptom of peripheral arterial disease. And as the disease progresses, we land up with critical limb ischemia, which results in pain at rest, ulceration, and necrosis and gangrene. And thrombotic process can result in acute limb ischemia. Common sites of claudication, obstruction can be in the aorta or iliac artery, femoral mm -hmm. arteries, popliteal mm -hmm. arteries. So today our area of interest is in the mm -hmm. distal to the popliteal artery ankle, calf, and foot. These are the traditional risk factors. Let us skip that. And uh, intermittent claudication is just like angina. So leg pain at a fixed distance results in 10 minutes. Can be more atypical symptoms. So we should not neglect atypical symptoms like numb, numbness, tingling, all these things. Uh, just, just muscular weakness. So they, these are also atypical symptoms in diabetic patients. So we should not uh, ignore those things. And also look for signs of uh, peripheral lateral disease like uh, glistening, shiny, hairless skin, trophic changes, all those things also we should look. And now we are all aware that the peripheral lateral disease has a very high mortality and morbidity. And uh, patients, especially who present with uh, acute limb ischemia, they have, uh, or uh, critical limb ischemia, they have a very high incidence of uh, death from all causes increased around six times. So that's why. These uh, things need to be identified and treated. So screening and diagnosis is a different topic. Treatment options include rehabilitation, drugs, and revascularization. And revascularization in uh, intermittent claudication is uh, in, in symptom improval, uh, improvement of symptoms and functional status. And for critical limb ischemia, it is limb salvage. Whatever cases I will show, they are all limb salvage because they all had critical limb ischemia. And in critical limb ischemia, the treatment goals are, first of all, to improve healing because almost all these patients present with some non-healing ulcer, gangrene. So first of all, are most of the time, our target is to improve healing of the wound. And uh, I mean, ironically, many of these cases get referred to me by the plastic surgeons. And normally, surgeons uh, do not evaluate much for uh, underlying stenosis, but uh, plastic surgeons are plastic surgeons, they evaluate and they refer to me. Limb salvage, then improve functional capacity, improve quality of life, because most of the, uh, many times the patient will be having severe pain and which is even worse at night. So there is this quality of sleep, quality of life is grossly compromised and sometimes maybe prolonged life. Revascularization is, of course, better because the rates of amputation are 8 to 20% with revascularization and more than 50% without revascularization. The ideal revascularization strategy is to have a three flowing arteries, the anterior peroneal, and the posterior TVL. However, we should try to salvage whatever is possible. Sometimes angiogram-oriented revascularization is also important. All these devices are not important. Okay. So how to plan a uh, below the knee intervention or critical limb ischemia? Most important is imaging. CT NGO is of great help, but sometimes what we have seen is that CT NGO, uh, it is very difficult to decide uh, about the 
uh, actual strategy from city NGO because conventional NGO or DSA gives us a better idea about our length of the lesion, about the distal targets and all. The city NGO sometimes is fallacious in the presence of calcifications also. Uh, but definitely for pre-op assessment, city NGO is important. MR NGO about peripheral vascular disease, I am not very sure. I'll take uh, Rajesh's comment later on. First of all, we have to we should try to understand the entire anatomy, including the foot anatomy. Because when we are talking about below the knee intervention, then we are also talking about the uh, ankle and below the ankle. And because many of these lesions, many of these non-healing ulcers, the gangrene, they are in the foot actually. And uh, if we can limit the extent of amputation, that, that, will, that will be of great help to the patient. If we can convert a below the knee inter, uh, amputation to just mid-foot amputation, that will be greatly beneficial to the patient. So understanding of the entry and exit sites is very important. In coronaries, we always uh, give more stress to the distal uh, exits, but in peripheral intervention, sometimes even improving the inflow is sometimes uh, beneficial, even if we are not able to improve the outflow in some cases, even improving the inflow sometimes definitely helps to get more collateral supply and uh, improving the perfusion. Presence of side branches is of great help in the peripheral arteries because there are two types of concepts of intervention. One is direct revascularization, where we open the artery that is responsible for the ulcer or that is occluded and thought to be giving rise to symptom. However, sometimes we go for an indirect revascularization. That means, suppose we are not able to open the intratibial artery, then we'll try to open the posterior tibial artery or the peroneal artery so that the collaterals will supply the intratibial like that. Collateral circulation assessment and understanding is also important. Collaterals do help us in our revascularization. Then distal target, sometimes use of road mapping is very important. Appropriate support, definitely, in all cases of uh, below the knee intervention, uh, the vascular excess is usually integrated femoral puncture. In uh, patients who are thin, who are uh, thinly built, in those cases, we can go with a common femoral, we can try for a common femoral integrate puncture. In obese patients, sometimes very difficult to get a common femoral puncture, so there we, should, uh, we can puncture the superficial femoral. However, uh, crossover strategy in below knee intervention is not going to work because sometimes the length of the soft length of the balloons, the uh, issue of support definitely remains. So always uh, we should try to get the anti-grade uh, puncture for below, nine, below the knee intervention. Then, of course, medical therapy with antithrombotics and all. Just a quick review of the enchiosome concept because uh, this is in some cases, this concept has also been challenged, whether it is uh, truly applicable or not. But uh, it is a traditional concept, well-established concept that we should try to open up the artery uh, that is uh, supplying the distribution where the disease is. If the uh, ulcer is at the level of the hill, then we should try to open up the posterior tibial artery. If the ulcer is uh, at the distal part of the foot, then we should try to open up the intratibial artery and the dorsal spadis. Then uh, always try to, uh, always we should look for a direct revascularization rather than for an indirect revascularization. Numerous publications, meta-analysis have shown that freedom from major amputations, freedom from major uh, limb events is uh, better with direct revascularization as compared to an indirect revascularization. I'll just skip this. Then for below the knee intervention, sometimes uh, we get a little confused with the anatomy, especially in the presence of a desert foot where uh, the vessels, vessels are not very clear. In those cases, we should try to get as much information as uh, possible for the anatomy because uh, with a proper anat ident anatomic identification, the revascularization planning becomes much better. Another thing I sometimes, uh, I mean, uh, that I have learned is using long sheets. Suppose from the uh, SFA, if we are using a 45, uh, uh, 45 centimeter sheet, then uh, the sheet goes almost to the uh, popliteal artery. And, but we should not try to occlude the sheet because we should, the uh, sheet should not touch the lesion. Otherwise, there can be uh, retrograde thrombus formation also. Sheet, sheet should be little above the lesion. 
two things there is that uh, it saves a lot of contrast and we get a very detailed anatomic picture also using a long sheet then uh, for foot imaging there are some sometimes we don't get, take a adequate foot imaging but we should try to take a foot imaging uh, keeping the ii parallel to the foot so if we are going for an ap then we should uh, get the ii parallel to the foot and for lateral imaging we should get the foot uh, ii parallel to the foot so that we have a good longitudinal image that delineates uh, all the loops and uh, the arteries so that we it becomes little better to understand <clears throat> the anatomy also to make the interventional strategy most of the time uh, we need these long balloons because that is what we use for btk intervention so if we are going for uh, a btk intervention then normally uh, or in my lab, I use, uh, I keep this 2 into 100 or two, sometimes 2 into 1, so 2.5. Many of the international speakers also speak about use of intravascular ultrasound in the peripheral arteries for adequate sizing of the balloons. But I don't know whether that facility is available in India. We do not use that. We just go for a visual uh, estimation. So long balloons, usually 2.5 into 100, some uh, oh, 150 is also available like that. So long, long balloon, low pressure, long angioplasty is needed. BTK intervention in CTOs, uh, again, same thing that uh, uh, arterial excess is important, that we should go for an integrated femoral puncture, or in some cases, we can go for a retrograde puncture, like we can... Uh, there's some disturbance may i request for, yeah so uh, arterial excess is uh, i mean uh, definitely integrate puncture but some cases we need to go for a retrograde puncture with a pedal excess or uh, with a intratibial artery puncture then procedural imaging understanding the anatomy then we have to understand how to go whether we are planning for an intraluminal approach or a subintimal approach or dissection and reentry or integrated retrograde approach. So understanding the anatomy, this is the popliteal artery. The popliteal artery on the posterior part, we see a peroneal artery and then a posterior tibial artery. Then uh, the uh, intratibial artery crosses uh, in the fossa between the tibia and fibula and comes to the anterior compartment of the leg. Peroneal artery, sometimes we do not go for a, uh, but this peroneal artery is very important artery because it has a very straight core. So many times this is a patent artery, which is extensively supplies collaterals to the intratibial and the posterior tibial artery. Then uh, this uh, peroneal, uh, then this uh, pedal, art, pedal anatomy is also important in uh, cases because uh, restoration of the pedal plantar loop sometimes is needed and uh, we can also restore that pedal plantar loop. So this is the arcuate artery. Then here the penetrating branch starts at the base of the first metatarsal and goes to the plantar side and forms the uh, plantar loop. So I'll just show one uh, few cases and then we'll discuss. So this is a chronic smoker. 48 year old male oh, and uh, in this I case uh, again I'll, I'll, uh, that there is a the SFA is uh, stenosed so this is a CTO extensively perfused by extensive collateralization is there and as we go down we see that the intratibial artery is occluded from the proximal part and uh, the peroneal artery is uh, patent Posterior TVL is also long segment occlusion is there. Posterior TVL is also long segment occlusion and uh, distal reformation. So this is a Burgers disease, classic Burgers disease. Patient presented with severe pain and uh, ulcer on the dorsum of the foot. So first uh, I put a supera in the SFA. and then targeted the intratibial artery because going by the angiosome con uh, concept, this patient had an ulcer on the dorsum of the foot. So I wanted to open the intratibial artery. But here, uh, posterior tibial was uh, well, re well formed distally by the collaterals and the plantar side is uh, was well perfused. So I did not uh, want to try the posterior tibial. Intratibial definitely long segment lesion. So, Actually, here I used a novel technique. 
we use this cross wash microcatheter in the coronaries for uh, subintimal dissection and uh, reentry in coronary situs we use cross wash in this case uh, there, there was a long segment occlusion so definitely we cannot go from true lumen to true lumen so we have to go with some form of uh, subintimal dissection and then uh, reentry so i will show how beautifully this case was done i mean this catheter actually helps so this is the cross wash uh, just rapid spinning of the cross bus and it advances going subintimally advancing subintimally so it is just following the course of the artery and then uh, i was very lucky actually distally the cross bus entered into the true lumen so i just confirmed here that the cross bus has re-entered dorsalis pedis uh, this was a selective injection into the dorsalis pedis then uh, there is a command wire. I used a command O one four wire, and uh, wiring of the dorsal arch was done. Then followed by two point five into one fifty long balloon inflation. So this uh, usually, uh, so as we can see that these lesions are here and uh, a balloon inflation long around uh, six to eight atmosphere with inflations, each inflation of around one minute. So long, low pressure inflations were given and uh, there are some focal stenosis there. So I also did some below the ankle angioplasty. And... Uh, after that, what we see is that the intratibial artery was uh, well perfused here up to the uh, dorsal arch and there was a restoration of the, so that, that I will show. So there was restoration of the pedal plantar loop. So now the loop is formed so that the distal circulation is also maintained the continuity, I mean, uh, the digital perfusion was also maintained. So, I mean, I was very happy with this, with this result. In this case, uh, the highlights are that we went for an integrate subintimal dissection and re-entry, and there was a restoration of the pedal, pedal plantar loop. Actually, we are all, uh, I mean, trained in, first we are cardiologists, so most of the time we use uh, this uh, coronary hardware only. Radiologists have a different approach. They will use a Berenstain catheter. They will use support catheters and their approaches and their selection of wires is also a little difficult and different. For us, uh, most of the time we use coronary CTO wires. Again, uh, this is again another case around 60 year old male and diabetic presented with uh, severe pain. I mean, intermittent claudication for six months and that has progressed to pain at rest for around uh, two to three weeks. And here, what we see is that the uh, popliteal artery is occluded, and there is distal formation, reformation of the posterior tibial artery. So the posterior tibial artery was formed, the peroneal artery was distally formed. However, the intertibial artery was uh, occluded. Posterior tibial was well formed in this case. As I have told that peroneal artery is very important artery because it gives a lot of collaterals to many, uh, to anterior and posterior tibial. So here uh, there is a very good size collateral supplying the anterior artery. And there is also sometimes called hibernating arteries. Hibernating arteries means all these arteries have a good lumen, patent lumen. And when we take a conventional angio, it appears like it is a long segment occlusion. However, the lumen is actually... Uh, patent in those cases and the length of the occlusion may be very narrow as in this case initially the occlusion appeared to be long occlusion however on a selective collateral injection what we see is that the distal part of the artery is very nice the proximal part is also nice as we see so in this case uh, the approach was because the intertibial was uh, flush cut off so uh, my approach was in this case to go for a retrograde wiring through the collateral. So this is the peroneal artery and from the peroneal artery using a floppy wire. So here we are going through the collateral and then going back into the intertibial artery like this and uh, 
So this is a trans collateral approach. Trans collateral. Then uh, the uh, the wire was actually going with pretty smoothly, and uh, the occlusion was actually osteal, very osteal, very short segment occlusion at the level of the uh, ostium of the antitubular artery. So this is the microcatheter, fine cross microcatheter can be used, not a problem with that. And so here almost got to the, so there was the occlusion at, right at the ostium. So then uh, ostium actually I punctured with uh, the uh, cross it 400. I could puncture the ostium and go into the, enter into the popliteal artery. And uh, then we could uh, pass an anti-grade wire. So from anti-grade uh, direction, we could pass an wire. Then we did balloon angioplasty and we did a kissing balloon to the, because there was some disease in the tibioperoneal trunk also. So we did a kissing balloon there. And uh, this is the final result. So optimum result we could achieve in this case, the patient was fine, all symptoms improved. There was no ulcer only severe pain at rest, so symptoms are resolved. In this case, uh, the highlight is uh, using the collaterals for a retrograde approach, so transcollateral retrograde approach, and then it was followed by anti-grade uh, wiring, then balloon angioplasty. A similar case, however, a little difficult uh, in this case was that the uh, proximal SFA, I mean, the SFA was also diseased, and the popliteal artery, there was a long segment occlusion here. And distal branches are not very clear, but there is diffuse disease. This patient presented again with gangrene of the toes, so toe gangrene and non-healing ulcer. Here also, I found that there was good collateral with distal formation of the antitibial artery. So in this case, similar approach, transcollateral retrograde approach. However, here the problem was the angle of the intratibial artery to the tibioperon to the common peroneal uh, artery was uh, very acute. So it was not possible to go for an integrate wiring because it was 90 degree. So trying to pass a wire from the integrate to the uh, uh, ATA was resulting in prolapse of the wire at this point. So what to do? I was, uh, I mean, I could, I tried for 10 to 15 minutes. Then I was unable to do integrate wiring. So what I did is I did a microcatheter rendezvous. So this microcatheter going through the collateral and coming back and then I took another microcatheter and then uh, I could, I was very lucky I would say that I could pass a wire, integrate wire from one microcatheter and enter it into the retrograde microcatheter. So, uh, I mean, now it goes, yes, now it enters into this. So, this is a microcatheter rendezvous technique, sometimes used in coronaries and uh, microcatheter rendezvous. Here, I used it for the below knee interventions and the rest of the procedure was uh, okay. So, then, uh, of course, passing the anti-grade wire into the intratibial artery and rest of the procedure was fine. Sometimes all these coronary techniques, CTO techniques also help us to, I mean, all of us, all of us want to have a successful procedure. So different types of techniques uh, help us to complete our procedures successfully. So uh, this is again, very interesting case. This is a 60 year old male, non-diabetic, hypertensive smoker. Patient had uh, a right common, uh, so, uh, right uh, common femoral artery and uh, SFA2 stent was done in 2019, uh, which was occluded after six months. Then uh, patient had a right uh, below knee amputation. Uh, it was done in 2020, now presented with non-healing ulcer in the left foot. Already patient had uh, midfoot amputation that was done in August, but patient, the problem was patient was having severe pain at rest. I wanted to go, but Dr. Shivam. So, severe pain at rest. So, I mean, uh, now just uh, I'll show that there was a disease here in the inflow part. See, this is outside the house. My daughter SFA, is with me. SFA was diseased. Now, society. Diwali. Rahul, Rahul, you mute. I have sugar ice cream. What? Sugar ice cream.
okay so uh, then uh, this was the oh, sorry so uh, right side was occluded left side uh, left side uh, the problem was i'll just go back yeah so left side the problem is that uh, here there is a disease uh, in the proximal uh, the in the superficial uh, femoral artery in the very proximal part so uh, if i need to stent this then uh, anti grade approach is not going to help because in an anti grade approach suppose the entry point is here i mean puncture site if it is here then uh, the sheath will extend for some distance if even if the puncture is here the sheath will be here so there is no space to deploy the stent first of all i i want to improve the inflow part so in this case the access was very difficult how to uh, go for this access the right was occluded so there is no chance of a crossover stenting the left i cannot go with an integrated puncture initially i thought that i will uh, do a surgical cut down of the popliteal because popliteal puncture is little risky so but uh, then the surgeon was not very uh, comfortable about the surgical cut down so uh, what i did is i i'll i'll tell then uh, in the biloni part so this is the biloni ngo and uh, in the biloni i'll show just i'm going step by step the posterior tibial artery was occluded the anterior tibial artery was flowing well the tibio the tibia, peroneal artery was not showing much flow so just uh, i'll show again the flowing so the uh, peroneal artery there was in stenosis here this, it appears to be very small caliber artery but the posterior tibial and the anterior tibial are good caliber arteries and the posterior tibial was occluded right was occluded stent was occluded distal reformation by collaterals a patient already had an amputation on the right below knee amputation was already done in 2020 so first i improved the i mean i this is a right brachial approach and then uh, stenting of the sfa and post dilatation achieved a good result in the sfa and then uh, so in this case i did a anterior tibial puncture so there was only one option to go for a retrograde uh, approach so in this case i punctured the anterior tibial artery normally uh, i i don't have the hockey stick uh, probe so hockey stick probe is a very small uh doppler probe used in peripheral vascular so with the normal doppler probe we mark the artery and then uh, with a micro puncture we go for the uh, puncture of the ata and then we put a ptca wire so this is uh, anterior tibial artery puncture so this is the puncture site around uh, 1 cm or 1.5 cm lateral to the uh, tbl uh, shin so this is the puncture site in the Anterior tibial artery, and uh, after that uh, again. But here again, it was like a hibernating artery. I could easily cross with a uh, pilot two hundred. Pilot two hundred uh, could manage to cross, and I went right up to the plantar loop. Then uh, did uh, long angioplasties. and after angioplasty this is the result we could achieve uh, optimal flow we, i cannot say optimal flow but we could restore the flow in the uh, posterior tibial artery right up to the pedal plantar loop so that was like a complete revascularization and post procedure again i did doppler to confirm that the anterior tibial artery was flowing well so crossing strategies in cli can be anti grade or retro grade anti grade we can try if it is a short segment occlusions in a straight portion then we can go from true lumen to true lumen but most of the time these are long lesions multiple lesions and in those cases usually we need to have some uh, subintimal dissection and then followed by distal reentry retro grade approach can be a pedal plantar loop access or a transcollateral access or a retro grade access so i i mean uh, i have shown four variety of cases with uh, subintimal access then uh, transcollateral access and retrograde access so this is uh, this is all i have to say about that thank you
Anupam, very great presentation and uh, you have uh, practiced all the coronary technical skills uh, for the peripheral inter intervention. That is commendable. Thank you. Sir. Nice presentation. Those words coming from you really mean something, sir. <laughs> <laughs> great, great job. Great. Few point I uh, want to discuss about, uh, as you initially mentioned, about atypical <coughs> symptoms. Those patients who are diabetic uh, with renal failure and sometimes not much of the symptoms, it should be a routine in the OPT to have an ankle brachial index. Sometimes it's a surprise you take the patient on the table and found that, okay, right common iliac or right femoral is absent. So a routine practice in the OPD to have an ankle brachial index. And then there are few devices which are available which can measure uh, blood pressure of all the four limbs. And it's available in the market. So specifically those patients who are, say, diabetic or collagen vascular disease, or those with a renal failure and any of the symptoms, a ankle brachial index of all the four limbs is going to be helpful. <laughs> Second thing uh, regarding, say, ref referred by the plastic surgeon to uh, yourself for the peripheral intervention, each and every institute should have a intra-departmental collaboration, including those with the diabetic clinic and the vascular surgeon, and also to sometime with the orthopedician to have this uh, foot or below the knee clinic, foot care clinic, which can give an idea about and a comprehensive management of this patient can be done instead of having only a plastic surgeon uh, to take care of the say, skin and subcutaneous part. So that clinic is lacking in most of the institute, but then this is something which has to be there to have an improvement in uh, uh, foot care to prevent the amputation to the great extent in these patients. You are comment about say three vessels, uh, two vessels versus one vessel angioplasty. It all depend on uh, angiosome concept or what? Uh, can you comment yes, about it? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we are uh, not able to achieve optimal uh, three vessel flow then at least we should try to open up the vessel that is supplying the affected angiosome, sir. Uh, right, right. Sir, sir. Have you tried uh, any CO2 angiogram? So this is the site where the CO2 can also be used, and it's very simple. Those patients who do an renal failure, you just inject that CO2 uh, to do the angiography and do the intervention. I had tried in few patients for the SFA, but then below, knee, below the knee is the one where it can be safely okay. used and uh, it's uh, not so costly. It's a cheaper one catheter has to be pushed across and that can uh, limit the contrast uh, contrast amount for these patients. Mm -hmm. Sir, I have no idea, sir. I have no idea about CO2 injury. Uh, you can very well try it as you are doing good work about the peripheral. You can ask the industry fellow to sir. report you and have few cases of the CO2 angiography and angioplasty yes, as sir. well yes sir sir that needs a different uh, injector because that is what i inquired it needs a different injector no it's injector but then this industry people do come with this injector and you can very well push it so injector is not a problem i did few cases injector is there otherwise there is a syringe 50 cc i think with the plunger you just uh, unlock it and then the co2 can go so basically it do need uh, only uh, CO2 cylinder, which of course is there in most of the hospitals. So that right. should not be a limitation. And this uh, plunger with 50 cc syringe is reusable. So you can have one and that can be used in multiple uh, number of patients. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the uh, assess site, uh, as you mentioned about the popliteal artery, which is somewhat risky, people have done and we have also practice in the department to go ahead transpopulator to do the SF intervention in those where the integrated approach is difficult. Sorry. And to, to have now hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic uh, control of the bleeding from the puncture site at the popliteal uh, level, um, I have deployed the per close device. So that's another <laughs> option. 
Yes, sir. So, so uh, that is what I wanted to ask, sir. I, I mean, the vein is very close by in the popliteal mm -hmm. artery. The actually the vein is superior and the artery is deeper. So when we put a perclot, sir, doesn't it uh, create problem for the if we? No, no. Uh, so see, you have to do the ultrasound to look for where the good separation between the two, and it's going to be say ultrasound guided puncture for the popliteal artery, and yes, then sir, you can yes, of sir. course very well close it instead of going blindly. Uh, for the popliteal artery puncture. Another mm -hmm. option is you go anti-greatly and have a balloon dilatation at the puncture site for some prolonged time and that will take care of the local hemostasis after having transpopliteal puncture. There are a few transpedal approach as well. You have uh, very nicely mentioned about the anterior TPL, but then posterior TPL is another one where you can enter. And then, so these are a few things. Uh, Regarding the balloon, you mentioned a long size balloon. They are long and tapered balloon as well. Yes. So you sir. do I say 2.5 distally and approximately three, uh, which is available with most of the company and that can be used. Um, it is very important not to have a marked dissection or flow limiting dissection by using the smaller balloon. And therefore, sir. the recommendation is to have a long, long balloon, maybe 80, 100, 120, and then inflation should be for the long time. Longer. Long time means it's a three minute or five minute inflation that's going to be helpful to prevent the dissection and also the good flow across the intervene artery. Cross boss, a uh, very nice presentation of this thing and also the transcollateral approach for the retrograde. And one important thing uh, which you mentioned about the ipsilateral puncture, See, going through the collateral, pushing the microcatheter is not possible when you do have a crossover scene. Yes, so sir. here comes the length of the hardware, which is a restriction. And therefore, when you're supposed to have now uh, integrate ipsilateral puncture of the femoral artery uh, for successful intervention, because most of the time, the length of the hardware is not so sufficient to do the intervention um, at the level of, say, the transpedal or posterior artery or at the arch level, whether it's a uh, anterior plantar arch or the posterior arch, where the length of uh, various devices is going to be a limitation. We commonly do use uh, nitroglycerin uh, in coronary intervention, but then there is a slow flow in peripheral I see given the intraarterial injection do improve the flow across this vascular system as well. So sir. one should frequently use the nitroglycerin to have improved flow across. Sir, I, I would like to ask one question. Yes, in few please. cases, I have also given 1,000 units of heparin intraarterially. <laughs> it's very important to have now no in-situ thrombosis, which is very yes, frequent sir. whenever you do you you say cross uh, cross over C, then so it's very important to have a repeated flush of this catheter because in case you are going to push the thrombus across your all effort or opening of the uh, disease artery is uh, going to be wasted. Okay. Aspiration uh, means they have they have they have few cases and few practice where you use the distal protection device uh, BP cuff distally to prevent the distal embolization during the peripheral intervention. But then that can also be practiced. But thrombosis, yes, no, it should not be there. Hydrogenic thrombosis of the catheter, and therefore, and therefore uh, it's. Uh, Important to have an appropriate uh, ACT uh, during the periphery intervention as well. There are a few upcoming uh, studies as you are, uh, you and we all are cardiologists. Each and every aspect of coronary intervention being translated into the peripheral system as well, which includes uh, peripheral imaging. IVUS, uh, OCT, less frequently IVUS is there and the IVUS is going to help for infrapopliteal intervention to look for the size of the vessel. Say two or 2.5 millimeter balloon can be of a smaller size for a vessel which is three or 3.5. So people have started using intravascular imaging to have an appropriate sizing of the balloon for the balloon dilatation. And that's going to help in long-term patency of these intervene arteries as well. Those patients with the diabetes and the renal failure, you frequently do come across with uh, uh, calcified peripheral arterial disease and where comes the 
uh, thrombectomy, uh, atherectomy, and also the rota ablation for peripheral arteries. So these are the upcoming modality which has been practiced in the Western world, but we don't have these devices by now, but then these are something which has to be used in future. Any I'm further? I want ah, to ask you, nice to see you, your giant of peripheral intervention. <laughs> it is always a treat to hear, and Anupam has shown brilliant cases. What is your experience of this uh, DEB? Well, clinically, how you follow up with the patient and how you find them, whether do imaging or just a clinically sufficient? Below needs DB, yes, DEB is another, another uh, modality which is uh, being used for the infrapopriteal few of the your cases i could uh, very well see there is some dissection and edginess of the intervenous artery uh, yeah. prolonged inflation and then to be followed by drug eluting balloon inflation is a good choice to prevent the restenosis at uh, at at the site of the intervention okay. stand uh, big no for this uh, vessel because it's a long uh, long lesion mm -hmm. and you cannot go ahead and put the drug eluting stand from here to there uh, but then the, there are few reports of um, uh, absorbable stand being put uh, for the infrapopliteal uh, okay. intervention. Oh, what but then it's mean? it's going to be, say, focal. Yes. Sir. Uh, you, you do an balloon dilatation and then there is a focal dissection, which can be flow limiting dissection, uh, which is something you feel like it's going to get recoil and reocclusion at that particular focal point, you can go ahead and put the stent across, which can be your routine drug eluting coronary stent. And then, of course, few people have uh, tried to put uh, uh, absorbed stent as well. What is your practice, sir? You are using dev or sometimes using stents also? Uh, most of the time, it's a prolonged balloon inflation, which is helpful. Drug eluting uh, balloon, I have not so frequently used. A uh, few other cases, yes, I have used drug eluting balloon. Uh, that's from the Medtronic. And uh, I have used few cases uh, where absor has been put. And then, of course, the drug eluting normal stent, evolumacillating stent has been and what one of my patient, one of my patient, uh, post CABG after putting the absorbed stent, uh, and it's more than 10 years, I think he's doing well. Okay, that's good, right. sir. And have so you used the... those uh, drug eluting stents that Boston has come up with, Illuvia or something for the SFA? Have you used no, them? that that can be used, yes, and it's uh, it has shown the good patency rate at the long term, so that's the upcoming modality for peripheral stenting on the SFA and also the common ELAC, but it has not been used uh, at my institute. Yeah. And sir, what is your usual antiplatelet regime in isolated cases of PVD without angioplasty? Antiplatelet, uh, there is a good amount of uh, discussion and publication about antiplatelet therapy. Um, Aspirin, of course, to be given, and uh, mm -hmm. as they are frequently been associated with the other peripheral arterial and coronary artery disease, aspirin is for the secondary prevention, I would say. And uh, clopidopril, uh, it's only after, say, intervention, uh, putting a stand across uh, SFA or common alive for, say, three months, and thereafter you can continue with the aspirin. But then data of, say, dual antiplatelet therapy for peripheral arterial disease for the intervention is somewhat limited and yes. there is no consensus about of course the aspirin has to be continued sir so yeah. i have switched to I... I have switched to the compass model sir using aspirin with rivaroxaban 2.5 mg bd okay <laughs> that's a good choice uh, compass trial there are there are there are few there are few report of say doing a routine ankle brachial index in patient with atrial fibrillation and yeah. about 8 to 10 percent, I'm not sure the exact percentage, a significant percent of the patient do have asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease following peripheral embolization because of the so, AF. Yeah. And therefore, it's there's the role of river exception as well. In case yeah. it's the AF. But sir, how reliable is the ABI? Because in atherosclerotic arteries, this index can be underestimated also because they are hard arteries and then they will not collapse also. So, but then, then you are going to have a low, low blood pressure. And that's yes. given an idea about. And thereafter, of course, you are going to have a confirmation by, say, ultrasound Doppler and uh, CT yeah. angiography. Uh, as Anupam has told about, the MR is another option in case the RFT is deranged. But mm -hmm. then the quality quality of image, which is there with the 
CT is far better compared to MRI to have an idea about the site of occlusion, its length, and also the collateral circulation across. Yeah, thank you. Sir, how much discrepancy you found, find between the CT imaging and the conventional angiographic imaging? I find somewhat uh, great discrepancy. This depend on uh, <laughs> this depend on who is reporting from the radiology, <laughs> and it varies from individual from institute wise. Yes, so a sincere and uh, reporting can improve the result of the CT angiography. We do come across CT coronary angio, everything is normal and do come across the occlusion. Sure. We do have a CT angio for the CTO cases, but then in routine, we do come across the reporting from our radiologists having certain limitations. So that's mm -hmm. the individual practice of a radiologist and individual department, how, how much is specific they are uh, for screening and diagnosing the CT scan. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, uh, sir, regarding uh, the drug eluting stents in the below knee intervention, so like sir was telling that most of the time, even if we find that the lesions are long initially, but the arteries are actually hibernating. So if the lesion is uh, say less than 40 and it is at a place where it is, uh, we know that the stent is not going to have some, uh, you know, fracture or something, won't the drug eluting stents will have a longer uh, revascularization rate, like acute luminal uh, gain also will be more, sir? Uh, if we... See, uh, um, one of the concepts regarding peripheral intervention for uh, limb ischemia is to improve the healing or healing of the bone. And therefore, as a temporary opening of the artery for uh, four to six months is going to end a good healing, good collateral across and thereafter. But then, of course, there is the limitation of this peripheral intervention. You do have a reocclusion reached, you know, at the site, and which can, of course, be improved by a drug eluting balloon. And also the stent, uh, limitation of the drug eluting stent. We don't have a long size. And <coughs> with the long size, the stent, uh, which of course is there for the coronary as well, there is a limitation of um, same stent restenosis. And if we use imaging like IVERS, IVERS, can we use that focal place where the, uh, the maximum stenosis, usually it's one or the two places where it's the low limiting region. Even in yes, the as I, I mentioned about that, uh, whenever you have say, well, like balloon dilatation, there is a flow limiting dissection, and you feel like, and then of course, IVERS or the OCT can very well uh, <coughs> grade the type of dissection, it is there. And accordingly, you can go ahead for say, focal stenting at the site. Sir, and one thing I was reading, sir, knew there was uh, some mechanical scaffold that has come, it's known as TAX. So they are like six mm small, small stents and they have used it in the peripheral vessels so that they can have a greater acute luminal gain, but they don't have a disadvantage like stent. So recently they have come with a trial. Uh, we don't have- See, uh, Meryl, uh, Meryl has come with the drug eluting uh, stent and uh, they, are, uh, they are doing a trial for the peripheral arterial disease as well. I'm not sure whether it's for the infrapopulator, but it's for the renal. Uh, and then what's the size, I'm not sure about. But then uh, in Western Western country, the drug eluting, sorry, absorbable stent are available for the peripheral as well. Uh, putting a multiple stent is a limitation because you cannot go ahead and put say 100 millimeter or 120 millimeter stent. So <clears throat> the good practice is to have um, focal stenting at the site of say flow limiting dissection after balloon dilatation. Yeah. Pavan, how are you doing? You are mute, dear. I am good, sir. Nice to see you after a long time. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you are based in Hyderabad, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes. Nice. Any any comment? Okay. Very nice. lot, lot of points. Doctor, very nice cases. Yeah. And, uh, in my routine practice, also for uh, chronic coronary syndromes, uh, nowadays uh, patients with multiple risk factors. I have the compass uh, model actually. 
and uh, definitely i think uh, the number of uh, 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 acute limb ischemia we see in this follow up cases have definitely come down sir <coughs> Anupam, one thing, one thing I want to ask: Sir. Do you think it should be a routine to look for peripheral in uh, cases of multiple risk factors? Do uh, peripheral vessels also during uh, coronary angiography? What is the routine practice? I mean, uh, yeah, unless no, they seem to make uh, routine uh, angiography uh, because, uh, will yeah. be too much. I think as yeah. Sir has mentioned that ABI assessment should be routine. There should be some in, clue then. Yes, sir. Yeah. In patients with diabetes, CAD, or yeah. all the CAD risk factors. See, one of uh, one of the reason why we usually don't go for the peripheral uh, iliofemoral angiography yeah. is most of the most of we people have shifted from transfemoral to transradial. Yeah. Yeah. One Edna thesis where we had a transfemoral uh, assess and then did the renal and mesenteric artery routine angiography for those patients with the triple vessel disease. Yeah. And Pawan, if I'm sure about, we got around 10 to 15% of the patient who had now associated asymptomatic mesenteric artery stenosis. But instead of going for, say, uh, select angiography for lower limb peripheral arterial disease, and then there is a concern about the radiation exposure mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Anupam, will you like to comment how to have the radiation protection? Most of the time, you are standing just nearby yes, sir, the yes, intervene sir. artery, and then there is a risk of the radiation exposure yes, sir, as well. Yes, Especially so then, if we are going for a intratibial puncture or a retrograde that's puncture. Right, that's the, right. That's right. That's right. And your hand is there the, under the fluoroscopy. Yes, Directly. So that is a concern, and therefore, a routine uh, screening, angiographic invasive screening is not recommended. And then there are a few new devices which has come where you can very well have no protection from the radiation for peripheral intervention, which include one, your whole uh, covering of the body operators, uh, operator can cover all of the body of himself during the intervention. So there are a few devices which has come. Are yes, they sir, in the market? I, yeah, I've seen that. It is like a... Mm -hmm. Full gown hanging from a gown. And that's what you just <laughs> be behind that gown, and then there is no radiation. But then yes. there is always a concern to have, and then peripheral intervention is the one which do take certain time. Sir. It's not like coronary, you can finish in a very little amount of time. And therefore, the radiation exposure is also on the higher side. And therefore, one should have a radiation protection during the peripheral intervention. Yeah. So, so it is still a routine to take last case in the lab at eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> See, uh, nowadays I stop doing uh, cases after eight, so it's around five or six. That's what. Eight to six. But still, still, sir, uh, for me it is the last case <laughs> of the day. <laughs> No, Peripheral see, the see, the, the problem is, uh, problem is coronary is not so we, long. We, we, and for the peripheral, see, if you are going to do the SFA, at one side, the balloon inflation is going to have, say, five minutes of inflation time. So five, 10, 15, and 20, or maybe 25 minutes is the inflation time, at, uh, say, distal to proximal. And therefore, 25 minutes, to ho jata and then, so, so most of the time, they are lengthy one. So yeah. we, we copy you, sir. Whenever such things are required, we, we copy <laughs> So nice of you. Thank you. And not only copy, I actively seek advice from sir. Most <laughs> welcome. I, I think everyone know. does that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The best part is that he responds in minutes. Yeah. It's a privilege and honor. That is important. Sir, yes. sir. Very accessible and always ready to help. So actually, we missed you, sir. We had planned a peripheral intervention here in at Chhattisgarh CSI. Ah, I couldn't come because of certain yes. personal mm. reasons. Sure, I will be there whenever you are going to ask me next time. Sir. I think, sir, we had a great discussion today, and it's uh, time to bring it to a close. And we hope that we we'll see you more often in discussions sir because uh, you know without you with you the discussion becomes uh, very interesting more interesting than otherwise it is so yes. so nice of you thank you very much i will spare the time and will like to join you people whenever 
खत्म करते हैं सर गुड नाइट गुड नाइट गुड नाइट स्मिथ